Good evening, everybody, and welcome all to this webinar tonight, Personality Disorders and Substance Use, Tips on Effective Treatment Approaches. I'd like to welcome the over 1,000 participants who've joined us for tonight's webinar and the viewers who are watching the podcast later. There are actually over 4,000 people have registered for this webinar, which is a record as far as I know, and it is a Dark contrast to the beginning of MHPN webinars where I can remember facilitating for 60 people. So it's very exciting to have you all with us tonight. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which our webinar presenters and participants are located. I would also like to pay my respects to elders, past and present. I'm Mary Emilaeus and I will be facilitating, facilitating tonight's session. Uh, I have a background in general practice in psychotherapy and now I am a psychiatry trainee in far north Queensland. And I would like to um, give a particular welcome tonight to all the people who are watching the webinar from Headspace Cairns. And as you can see, I have a different background to normal and I'm actually at Headspace Cairns in a private room. Uh, so I'll join them later on. Now I would like to uh, introduce you to the host for tonight. So Project AIR Strategy for Personality Disorders and MHPN have engaged in a collaborative partnership to plan, produce and deliver this webinar, which is exploring substance use and personality disorder. For more information or resources about assessing, treating and or living with a personality disorder or someone who has one, go to the Project AIR Strategy for Personality Disorders website. Uh, in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, you can see a small file icon and that has the resources for tonight's webinars. So there's some recommended articles um, and other things which the, the uh, presenters will mention tonight. And Project Air Strategy is projectairstrategy.org and I really recommend their resources. One of the um, great privileges for me in doing this job is that I get to meet interesting people and find all the best resources in the country. And I, the Project Air Personality Disorder resources are fantastic. So I'd like to next introduce to you um, our panellists for tonight. So in no particular order, uh, Hester Wilson is a um, general practitioner based in Sydney. But Hester, you also have, I understand, um, a fellowship in addiction medicine. Now, I just um, wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about how you became interested in addiction medicine from the background of general practice. Uh, look, it was, it was pretty serendipitous, but I have to say um, I, we see a lot of drug and alcohol and mental health issues in the general practice setting. And what I was aware of for myself was I actually didn't have the skills or the tools I needed to actually assist my patients, particularly with their drug and alcohol issues, and so got interested in, in, in doing that better uh, and ended up uh, becoming an addiction specialist as well as a GP. Thank you. It's great to have you on the panel tonight. And it looks a bit Thank colder you. in Sydney than it is in Cairns, I'm guessing. It's very so then, cold here. <laughs> so then I think we might move to, um, perhaps we'll go in order of coldness. I don't know whether it would be Canberra. Let's go to Canberra next. So Jeff, um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jeff Ward, who's a clinical psychologist in private practice in Canberra. And Jeff, I noticed that you had a really significant career also in um, teaching and research. And, and now you're more in private practice. I was wondering if you could tell us what was the most interesting piece of research in um, substance use that you did. That's a bit of an on-the-spot question. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, I think early on I uh, uh, did research at the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre on uh, HIV risk-taking behaviour. And that, to me, at the time, um, before we had medications for AIDS was a very significant problem in Sydney and uh, there was a sense of urgency about trying to uh, understand what the causes of that behaviour were and so I was involved in a number of research projects that looked at that uh, and so uh, that, that seemed to me very important at the time and, um, and also uh, uh, had me going out interviewing hundreds of uh, people who use drugs and uh, talking to them about their risk-taking behaviour, which was uh, uh, a very interesting experience at the time. Thank you. And I, I can see that you've had a really interesting um, 
and varied clinical career. And so we're really excited to have you um, on your expertise on the panel tonight. And then I think we'll move down to Tasmania. So Trevor, uh, whereabouts in Tasmania are you? And um, I can see that you've also had a lot of, of interest in, um, in teaching as well. So what, what are some of the, um, I can see that you've been teaching in, you know, families and recovery to people with lived experience of mental illness and substance use problems. Um, what's one of the most interesting sort of things that you've, that you've or the group that you've enjoyed teaching? Um, well, to answer your first question, uh, down the south of Tassie, we're about an hour south of Hobart, so it's um, probably about zero out there this morning, tonight. Um, we've been getting some frost, so yes, they're starting to turn. Um, teaching, I was teaching um, uh, teaching psychologists at, at uni last. Prior to that, was um, it was the um, the recovery work, um, so that involved kind of travelling around the country and working with mental health teams and and uh, talking about how to how to uh, what, what are some of the challenges in supporting overall recovery for people and not not just kind of treating symptoms, um, and that that included families as well as um, you know mental health um, consumers. Um, as, and as well as the practitioners, so you know a good mix of those. And I think the thing that kind of stands out for me in terms of what was most interesting was um, hearing people's actual stories and the meaning, the narratives that people bring. Because I think that's always, well, for me at least, it's more alive than than um, uh, quantitative data and kind of looking at stats. It's actually the the, the meaning that people kind of um, give in their in their story. Thank you, and we're really looking forward to your contribution tonight as well. And I'll just point out, it's a little unusual for us to have um, two people from this, uh, uh, ostensibly the same discipline. So we have two psychologists tonight. They are coming from um, different kind of theoretical and um, therapy models in their approach to the case, and uh, I'm sure it's going to be a really rich and interesting discussion. So welcome, everybody. Just like to run through a few ground rules, and um, for those of you who haven't, Use the webinar platform before. Um, there is a chat box in the bottom of your screen, and if you'd like to open the chat box, um, you can you can see the little button there, and it'll open on a separate tab. I've mentioned the supporting resources, so that will include the slideshow, the ground rules, um, the vignette that we're going to talk about, and other resources in the resource library there. If you have any technical problems, you can click the. Uh, technical support FAQ tab for help uh, and there's a number that you can call as well. So currently we have nearly 1,300 people online and I know that there is more than one person on some of those links so welcome to everybody. At the end of the webinar there is going to be an exit poll uh, and it's a, a survey for you to just let us know your experience of the webinar and give the opportunity for suggestions for other topics and it's really important to provide that information for both Project AIR and MHPN. Um, there are some predisposing activities which were sent to you and for the, the GPs in the audience you need to do those for your um, CPD points. So explain that, um, that so the, the story there you received beforehand and also the ground rules about using the platform. Uh, but if you need them again, they're all down in the supporting resources tab. The way that we're going to work this tonight is that each of our panellists will give a short response to David's story um, from their sort of discipline perspective. And then there will be uh, questions and answers between the panel and between the audience and the panellists. So many of you have submitted questions beforehand when you registered and I have been provided with all of those in theme. You also have the opportunity to um, type into the chat box. Just remember that the chat box is a public space, so anything that you type in there is going to be read by 1,300 people. Um, so just keep it as a professional discussion. Um, you may find that some of the other uh, audience members might answer some of your questions. Um, and I think that's probably about all the ground rules we need to go through. So we're just going to quickly remind ourselves of the learning outcome. So we're going to have a facilitated panel discussion about David and at the completion of the webinar, participants will be able to describe the prevalence, 
distinguishing features and prognosis for people with personality disorder and substance use, demystify challenges, myths and constraints of providing treatment and support to people with personality disorder and substance use, and identify and prioritise evidence-based approaches which are most likely to be effective. So there is no way in which we can give you all the answers to all of your questions, but hopefully this opens up a space for discussion and for thinking about things in some ways that you may not have done before. So I think without further ado, I'd like to just um, remind us a tiny bit about David. So he's a 24-year-old engineering student um, and being a, a GP by background, his initial presentation makes me slightly anxious. So he missed his schedule appointment and then turned up later in the afternoon needing to be seen and then the second time the same thing happened. Um, however, this GP who saw him was very dedicated and rather than uh, rescheduling him, um, decided to take the opportunity to see him, feeling that he might be a vulnerable young person. Now, uh, this evening, just to let you know, because each of our, our panellists comes from a, a different kind of theoretical model, I'm just going to kind of let you know in advance the kind of um, framework from which they're responding. So Hester is kind of taking a medical model approach to how she might think about David. So I'd like to welcome Hester to respond from the GP perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, the first thing is, yes, this is a young man who was turned up at the GP practice outside his appointment time and we have a fabulous GP who's hopefully got a bit of space so that they can see him because they've recognised he's vulnerable. But it is a real challenge for us working in general practice if people don't turn up for appointments and then turn up at a time when they don't have an appointment and you've got a, a waiting room full of uh, people screaming babies usually. Uh, you know, and so for us in general practice, First thing I would say as a general practitioner, it's okay to say that they're too busy and that they need to come back at this scheduled time. But understanding at the same time that if it is possible that you may lose someone if you do that. Uh, it is interesting that this is a young 24-year-old bloke. Now, I don't know if it's just me, but I don't see very many men between the ages of kind of 16 and 40. Um, they're a group that don't attend general practitioners as much. And he's presenting with physical symptoms. So it's, it's, it's an interesting presentation. And then this age group immediately starts me thinking, what is happening uh, for him in a biopsychosocial kind of model? Um, he's, is he a new patient? Do we know him? Do we understand the family background? Because we are in a fantastic place as GPs quite often to have really valuable information about the, the patient's background. Uh, and I think it is important from the medical model to always consider, is there a physical cause to this? We do need to exclude that. We can't assume that everything is to do with, with mental health issues. Uh, so we do need to do as this GP did and check that there aren't other physical issues going on. Um, but do be aware of mental health uh, and drug and alcohol use that may be driving this presentation. Now, we are in the general practice setting ideally placed uh, to assist someone like David. We see 86% of the community in any one year will see uh, that much of the community. We're really fabulously well placed. The issue is that we're busy, uh, time poor, may not feel that we have the uh, skills to actually manage someone like David. And I have to say, when I read through it, I think, oh, geez, there's so much going on here. What do I just first? I think one of the things in the general practice setting is to remember to ask for permission. You know, so that he's coming with physical symptoms. So he's expecting you to focus on the physical symptoms. But explaining, look, sometimes this can be the way that we express as humans, we express our psychological distress. And so as a good GP, I want to ask you. Um, the HEADS assessment, which many of you may have heard of, that has a great deal, many more letters than that. But it's about the home environment. It's about education. It's about eating. It's about anxiety. It's about drugs. It's about depression. It's about suicide. It's about psychosis. So it, it's a really useful assessment that goes from the less um, tricky areas to talk about uh, to the more tricky areas and does include drug and alcohol use. And it's really important for us in general practice to be asking those questions. 
So coming to the drug and alcohol issue, really, how old was he when he first started drinking is a really good indicator. The other really good indicator was how old was he when he first started smoking cigarettes, if he's a cigarette smoker. Quite often that's the first indicator and people will start that at age 10, 11, 12, and it's a good indicator of um, psychological distress and environment. Um, and the fact that this guy is drinking daily, six to eight standard drinks, and he's having eye openers, he's having a drink in the morning, and as well as that, he's drinking at a hazardous level. Hazardous levels is anywhere above four standard drinks on any one drinking occasion in the social setting, and he's actually had some harm come off that in terms of at least his driving under the influence charge, but also perhaps relationship issues, and we know there's been a history of interpersonal conflict, including physical violence. Um, risky drinking or hazardous drinking is not uncommon, but this is a little bit different because there's also the daily drinking and the, and the drinking in the morning. And to me, this looks like someone who may well have alcohol dependency and self-medicating their distress. He's also using other drugs, a little bit of cannabis, uh, also some ecstasy, and he takes whatever's going. So there's some risk taking here of someone who is uh, happy to take whatever's around. And so that's another really important indicator of risk and what's going on for them. Um, so, you know, there's so much here. <laughs> there's so much here. When he talks about being anxious, those social difficulties, his low mood, the suicidal presentations, the impulsivity, which is, you know, I will take whatever there, I just, uh, I will take whatever I, I, I can get hold of because I just am this bundle of nerves. We have the, the family background for him, which is really, really important in the way his life experience has been. Um, the relationship issues with the recent stressor of the relationship breakup, and also his emotional management. So this is a guy who gets angry, who, who struggles to manage his emotions. Um, I'm moving on to the next one. Do I go back or what do I do? <laughs> no, that, that's fine, Hester. Yep. Thanks very much for that. So we will no obviously be, we'll be coming back um, to you later on as part of our panel discussion. But it was mm -hmm. it was fantastic to just see the kinds of things that a GP would be thinking about if they had time, as you pointed yeah. out. Um, but I ideally would be thinking about that very holistic perspective about what's going on for him. So thank you for that. And then mm. I'd like to bring in um, next Jeff. So down there in Canberra. Um, so Jeff, you're coming at this from a, a model which has a strong central focus on empathic understanding as the necessary basis for any therapeutic relationship and an integrative modular, modular approach to assessing his specific problems. Thanks, Jeff. Yes, that's right. So if I uh, uh, think about um, the case history, as a, I've received a letter from the GP and uh, David's going to come and see me. I want to talk about um, what, how I'm going to think about David, how I'm going to try and engage him. So first of all, I'd just like to make a few remarks about uh, my general approach to David's problems and treatment. The first one is that I would assume that David has excellent reasons for everything he's doing, even though those reasons, even though the behavior itself might be maladaptive. My job is to understand what those reasons are and to help him understand them. That is, I'll take a, a strong, validating, empathic stance and also help David to relate to or begin to relate to himself in this way. More broadly, uh, I, I would see David's problems as making sense in terms of his life history and help him to understand himself in this way. The general question I would hold in mind here is, how did David come to be this way? The third point on the slide here, doesn't really fit anywhere else, but it came up in in the GP's um, uh, letter uh, that there was an anxiety about dependency, and this anxiety quite commonly comes up um, with, in the treatment of people with uh, uh, borderline trays. So what I would say is David may develop a dependency on me, as he hasn't been able to depend on anyone yet. And any dependency he develops, I would see as provisionally stabilizing and transitional. And then it would become an aspect of the treatment process to be worked on at some stage and to help him to move uh, to, to a more autonomous uh, uh, position. So what I want to talk about tonight is uh, what is known as integrative modular treatment. 
this is recommended by Liversley and colleagues, and you can find the reference in the materials that have been provided. So we have evidence-based psychotherapies for borderline personality disorder, and these are mainly cognitive behavioral treatments like DBT or schema therapy, or they're psychodynamic treatments like mentalization-based treatment, transfer focus treatment, and in Australia we have the conversational model. But we don't have uh, much evidence for the treatment of other personality disorders. And the different uh, therapies for borderline personality focus on different areas of dysfunction and have different conceptualizations about what the problems are, but there's no substantial difference in their outcome. So in the integrative modular approach to treatment, um, we do two things. Um, one is we acknowledge that there are common problems across the different personality disorders in uh, the person's relationship with themselves and with other people, and the DSM-5 uh, includes this in, in uh, the current criteria. But then we also identify specific problems that a person may have with a particular personality disorder, or even within the same personality disorder, people can have a, a range of different problems. And it's recommended that we incorporate modules of treatment to address those specific problems, uh, and we can take these from different therapies. There are three general phases of treatment that we talk about. First of all, we want to develop the therapeutic relationship with the person, engage them in treatment, help them to stay in treatment. Uh, we want to then look at the most distressing symptoms and address them. Uh, and finally, uh, if the person stays in longer term treatment, we want to deal with the underlying personality disturbance. So in terms of the first phase, engaging David and holding him in treatment, uh, I would ask myself the question, what do I need to do to increase the likelihood that David will engage in treatment? From the letter, we can see that um, David has problems engaging. So the main question here would be, how can I understand David and communicate in a way that ensures David understands that I get it, at least to some extent? I want to put myself in his shoes and see things from his perspective, and I want to put this into words and communicate it to him. In doing this, I'll use a wondering, collaborative style of empathy, understanding empathy as a co-constructive process. That is, we, David and I will do this together. So I'll do a lot of checking, asking, have I got this right? Have I understood you? Am I getting the sense that it's like such and such? Or I'm getting the sense it's like such and such, is that right? Now, this understanding uh, does a number of things. It creates connection, it reduces distress, it generates hope, and it begins the process of enhancing David's self-reflective capacity. Due to uh, indications that David can become overwhelmed emotionally, initially I would attune to David and probably keep uh, the conversation at a cognitive and general level. Second question I've got in mind is how can I generate a sense of hope in David that I might be able to help him? And the first thing I want to do, as I've just outlined, is understand him. But the second is that I want to provide a problem, a problem summary, a formulation of those problems, and a treatment plan that makes sense to him so that he can have some sense that uh, his problems might be uh, addressable. So David's problems area, problem areas, if we look at likely diagnoses, we have a likely diagnosis of borderline personality disorder and of an alcohol use disorder. And if we look at the specific problems that I was talking about, then we have a poor capacity for self-reflection and interpersonal understanding. We have attachment and interpersonal difficulties. Uh, there's social anxiety, uh, self-criticism, anger and aggression, suicidality, identity confusion, he doesn't know who he is, emotion dysregulation, low mood, and there's alcohol and, and other drug use there. So having seen David for two or three sessions, if I can engage him, uh, I would then provide him with a provisional case formulation. I would summarize David's problems as he has described them, and I would invite his additions and corrections to that. I'd provide a provisional developmental account of how these problems develop. We know already that he had an absent father, a critical mother, grew up in a drinking culture, and so on. 
Uh, and then I would uh, provide a treatment recommendation. I would tell David that uh, we should meet weekly, uh, focus on what David sees as the most important problems first, make sure there's agreement. We want to make sure in this way that there's agreement about the tasks and goals of treatment. And examples of treatment modules that might be used in response to specific problems, and these are only uh, just recommendations off the top of my head, but we would want to incorporate uh, early on, uh, probably immediately, we would want to address his suicidality. And here you could use uh, uh, DBT style interventions or any other evidence-based intervention. Uh, we might want to address his self criticism and we could use modules from emotion focused therapy, schema therapy or psychodynamic therapy, uh, his social anxiety if you're going to address that. For example, you could use CBT interventions or uh, again psychodynamic interventions. For his romantic difficulties, uh, there are a range of approaches you could use from interpersonal therapy, schema therapy or psychodynamic therapy. And for his alcohol and drug use, you could use motivational interviewing. Or if Hester was the GP and she has expertise in that area, I might communicate with her and see if she would manage those problems while I manage his psychological problems and we could keep in touch with, it, with each other around that. And finally, if David does stay in treatment for the longer term, we would try to address his underlying personality pathology. Uh, that is, uh, you, schema therapy and psychodynamic therapy are both designed to do that. Um, Yes, so that, that, that's... Uh, uh, Thanks very much. Yeah, my slides. Yeah, <laughs> just a um, fantastic uh, introduction. And I, was, I found this modular approach to therapy and personality disorder really refreshing. So I think it gives a name to something that a lot of us just intuitively do and maybe feel a little bit dubious that we're doing it. But um, it's great that, that it's actually something that has a really good theoretical basis. And I also yeah, really it, appreciate it. I, it. Yeah. You if I could just say something quickly about that, sure. that that's where I wanted to uh, forgot to say. I would encourage people to use what they know you, if they don't have specific tr training in a in a personality disorder approach. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Really encouraging. And I think also that the idea that his behaviour and his um, approach to life actually does make sense, even if it might be not not healthy. It, it's in some way making sense for him. So we'll come back to those kind of things in the panel discussion. And thank you again very much for that. And then um, Trevor is going to give us his response. Again, his background's in psychology, but he's coming um, to see David in a response that's in, informed by trauma and attachment theory, um, motivation theory, and mental health and addiction recovery models. Thanks very much, Trevor. Thanks, Mary. Um, Hi hey everybody, just to, just to uh, give you a sense of what, what we're talking about here, we're talking, personality disorders, we're talking about um, approximately 25% of um, presentations at emergency departments and about the same figure in terms of those that are admitted to psychiatric facilities um, have a diagnosable personality disorder. Overall population, you're looking at around 6.5-7% of the population that would meet that criteria. But I must say, I think, I think that's probably an underestimation, um, particularly when you look at comorbidity, and, and in this case we are when there's a substance abuse issue as well. The mm -hmm. overlap between those symptoms make, make diagnosis quite, quite difficult. Um, but generally in terms of David, um, I want to have a conversation straight up around you know, what, what, what he's experienced, uh, reflecting a lot of, of what Jeff has just said also, but then thinking about the broader picture in terms of what is recovery. Uh, often people will come in with a um, understanding that recovery is really defined in terms of symptoms and function management. Um, so it's kind of looking at that through a medical perspective and um, as we've seen from the start of this, it's the starting point. Um, but also encouraging a conversation about psychological recovery. And this, this draws on um, what, what um, um, people with lived experiences, the themes that come out of their stories around recovery include um, recovery is marked by increased hopefulness. Um, it's, in, it's marked by increased meaning, um, changes in identity um, to incorporate the, um, the, the new, their experiences of, of um, mental illness and, and um, substance abuse. 
and taking personal responsibility for making recovery work. Now, these are particularly challenges for, for, for both um, populations with personality disorder and populations with um, substance abuse issues but, you know, because um, the avoidance of responsibility or making other people um, responsible for what happens next is, is, is pretty symptomatic of, uh, mm. of these, both of these presentations. So, so understanding that's really important from the get-go. Um, but also then extending that into what is recovery, how does recovery, what does that look like in, in, in oneself, um, in, in terms of one's relationships um, and in terms of how, how people are functioning within the broader, broader community. Um, and, and therefore kind of we're necessarily tapping into attachment issues and how is this, how is this person um, uh, attached in their earlier relationships and how is that reflected in their adult relationships. What are the core relational themes that are showing up, and how do how do people um, uh, elicit certain responses from from loved ones that that may reinforce those those experiences of being perhaps a victim or, or so forth? And part of and again, this is partly what Jeff was getting at. I think is um, being able to create a safe haven, a, a firm attachment, reliable attachment space for for these clients to to, to basically start the recovery process. Is essential. Um, just very briefly, in trauma and attachment is a really rich field that covers that really is implied, implicated in in both um, personality disorders and um, substance abuse history. It may not be identifiable in all of those, but it's certainly represented in the vast majority. In this case, um, uh, his father was absent; he had a critical mother. That might be considered an unreliable kind of attachment system, and he was adapt. Some of his behaviours might be might be understood in terms of his adaptation to those, to those experience, earlier experiences and, and repeating those through his adult um, romantic relationships. He might be described as having an, an, an anxious attachment. He has this kind of profile, um, particularly in that last case where he's talking about his recent relationship where he pushes for more intimacy, he wants to be close um, and for, for whatever reason that his partner is experiencing that is a bit too much and they threaten to leave him. So they push, they reject him and then he threatens to suicide. And that's the cycle that he kind of gets locked into. And alcohol is kind of, a, and other drugs are a big part of that cycle for him. Um, so um, he's, he's also saying he's the first person he's ever, he's ever opened up to. Um, I'd, be, I'd be cautious around that. Um, what does that actually mean? Um, what are the implications of that in terms of you know becoming very quickly attached and um, and, and and repeating some of those same cycles in a therapeutic relationship? Um, other things that we don't haven't really got from the profile, but things I'd really like to kind of un unpack more and get a get a um, sense of would be to do with um, his his fracturing himself. How does that show up? How does he play different parts um, uh, against other parts within himself, like the critical parent and this, this reactive emotional side, for example? Um, and you know, and anxiety is clearly a part of his profile. And, and you know, so part of part of recovery from trauma and, and anxiety and, and you know, his, his, his incapacity to sit with emotion is learning how to actually be present to those experiences, learning how to tolerate his, his level of distress and not turn away from it so readily. Um, and there will be there will be um, unfinished business that, that kind of comes in there. And, and looking how he shows up physically, his his gestures, his movements, his bracing, his fight flight responses, the thoughts processes that, that, uh, that are evident or maybe unpacked, and any any evidence of any form of dissociation would be useful. Um, Trying to understand the function, the meaning behind um, David's substance abuse is critical because if, if, if in fact this is um, primarily, and I'm not saying it is, but if one, one theory might be that he's, um, he's self-medicating his psychological distress and he's using alcohol and or other drugs to do that, then um, first of all, my, my experience of working in the addiction field for 20 plus years, um, the accuracy of which people report their their substance use is usually questionable in the first instance, so there's ways of trying to get around that to kind of open open the open the space up to be able to get more information, more academic information. Um, it may be seen that he's he's seeking security and soothing in both his substance abuse and and in his um, social connections and his relationships. So it's all externalised. It's 
saw as taking something outside of himself to make himself kind of feel better. And he keeps his boundaries nice and kind of loose and blurry. And, you know, that's seen in his, his attendance of, um, or his lack of attending at the right times in, in his um, appointments with his GP. And that's bound to kind of roll over into the psychotherapeutic intervention as well. He's trying to numb his pain. Um, he's presenting in a stress state. He's using alcohol to feel stronger. He referred to that in his, his younger um, alcohol use and certainly to escape and avoid. So really, in terms of engaging him, we don't want to just say stop doing that because it's serving a purpose. We want to understand what that purpose is and, and explore other ways that may be uh, more helpful in terms of meeting that need so that it frees up some of the energy, energy to kind of um, turn some of that motivation towards change and moving forward. So we don't want to get into this process of convincing him. It's really using motivational interviewing skills as very useful in this regard to kind of help him activate his own motivation, particularly when when his um, whole nervous system is fired up and he's ready to kind of go into um, self-harm or suicidal or some other, other risk, high risk taking behaviour and substance abuse. Um, so I, I, a theory that, that came to me as I was thinking about David's case is that David's relationship with his substances, substances resembles and mirrors his relationship with uh, people in his life, seeking security, seeking soothing, um, and that is, I guess, an underlying attempt to kind of um, work through some of these, these original attachment injuries. Um, again, Trevor, can I just, just in the in um, we will get to a lot of this in the chat box. So I was wondering if you wouldn't mind just just covering the last yeah. two slides yeah. really yeah. Um, briefly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was just going to say um, that Jeff's covered some of this already anyway. In terms of these key features, um, pulling different pieces from different models, um, most models will be using very um, maybe slightly different kind of emphasising different parts, but there'll be elements of that in there anyway. So, so looking at symptom management as well as in terms of people's cognition and orienting into the overall future direction of their recovery. And lastly, then looking at what gets what gets in the road, the things that that's already showing up here for David in terms of activated and unhelpful um, relationship dynamics, blurring his boundaries, his, his insecure attachment dynamics are showing up. These are all risk, um, relapse risk features, and as well we need to look at clinicians' responses in terms of pushing them away, repeating those patterns and increase, you know, increasing the likelihood of burnout um, and slipping into these, these, these roles with somebody that's likely to reinforce that. So again, just trying, not, trying to avoid those things is really important and, and to be aware of them as the first, first case is important. Okay. Thank you. That's fantastic, Trevor. And look, really everybody, I would encourage you to revisit these slides afterwards and actually go and look these things up if you're not familiar with them. Trevor, actually, while you're still there, I actually wanted to bring a question from the audience. And so I noticed on your um, perspective there about recovery interference, one of the things is clinician burnout. And um, yeah. there's a question that actually, it just says, are personality disorders curable? And I just wondered if you wanted to comment on that. Can people actually get better? Yeah, well, absolutely they can. The evidence is still, um, in, in some respects, still in its infancy. Um, that um, the randomised controlled trials are showing, and, and Jeff pointed to this before too, that um, particularly things like um, DBT and some of the psychodynamic approaches, there's, there is evidence that people can improve across a whole range of different symptoms. Um, complicated in that though is the, is the substance abuse stuff, and we know that people can recover from, recover from substance abuse, so it's kind of how do you manage both of those same things at the same time is where the evidence is. So integrated treatments rather than a serial of treatments um, is the best way to go. But with looking at long term treatments, this, there's, no, there's no short fixes for this. It's, it does require usually a, a, a single relationship that's a reliable attachment frame and probably that'll be the core therapist. Um, and often that will also be integrating other, other services into the, into the, um, into the mix. Yeah, Thank but, you. But it is. Yeah. Yep. What, what I'll do, I, I think what you're saying there is really important and I know we've got a lot of uh, p participants in the audience who work under the Better Access Scheme and have 10 sessions mm. per year with the patient. So I'm actually yes. going to go over to Hester now and Hester as the GP, 
the audience have been, um, the psychologists that have presented to us have been quite comfortable with the idea of a long-term relationship and some therapeutic dependency kind of um, in the relationship that may be helpful for this young man. But I know a lot of GPs are really anxious about patients who say, you're the first person that's ever helped me and you know, you're already finding yourself making special exceptions to fit them in and it's only the second appointment. And we're quite fearful of people becoming dependent on us. So I just wondered if you wanted to comment on that, how you might think about that as a GP. Well, I think this is really, really fascinating. Uh, and, and certainly I, I've had that experience where someone has said, oh, Hester, you're the best GP. Nobody else understands me like, I, like you do. And I think, oh, geez, what have I done wrong? <laughs> what, what, have, what boundary haven't I held? Uh, look, and, and in general practice, as I was saying before, many of us have been in our practices for a considerable period of time. We may well have the capacity uh, and, and the knowledge and the history of that person, but we also have the capacity to have a longitudinal relationship unlike our, our colleagues who are doing our therapy under the Better Access scheme where they've got 10 appointments a year, we can see people as often as, as, as we want, as we need to. But it is really being clear on those boundaries and what you can and you can't do. And this certainly goes back to the point that was made before about how you integrate the care, how you work with other people to ensure that everybody is on the same page. The other thing I think for us as GPs is around our anxiety at their distress, our, our distress at their distress and wanting to fix that and, and the way it plays into us as practitioners who want to help, who want to relieve suffering and understanding that we, we can't do it in the way perhaps that we automatically would like to by offering extra appointments, by doing things beyond what is okay. So maintaining those boundaries is actually really important and it's hard to do. And certainly for us as GPs, not many of us actually do supervision, but I think that if you're seeing patients that, that are as complex as David is, that it's really important for us to get some support around our own psychological space as well. Okay. That's great and I know that the, the audience has been discussing self-care a lot in the chat box as well. Thanks very much for that Hester. And mm. now, Jeff, I wonder, it was actually your um, slides that introduced the idea about dependency and I, I, could, could you comment um, to us about whether it's possible to actually avoid that kind of dependency and yet still be helpful to the person? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I think the, the problem here is most people uh, if we talk about people with borderline traits, have uh, uh, an attachment style where there, there's both a, an immense fear of abandonment and uh, a desperate seeking for somebody who would uh, understand me and take care of me. And I don't think you can avoid the activation of this, and it sometimes does come, as uh, Hester was saying, with an idealizing tendency that, um, uh, you know, one moment you might be the best uh, clinician in the world, uh, but if that happens, it's likely that you're going to have clay feet uh, pretty quickly and we'll have to deal with that as well. The thing is, I, I think you need a way to think about the dependency to, um, uh, you need a theoretical model and attachment theory as, um, uh, Trevor was talking about provides us with the framework to understand this. Uh, and with that in mind, it, it helps you to uh, think clinically about what's going on in the relationship and then to manage that in a way that um, doesn't uh, uh, allow the, the slippery slope of, of boundary violations happening where the person's phoning you all the time and stuff like that. So it's the combination of keeping a firm boundary being available, but also finding a way with, if we're talking about David, to reflect upon what's going on, to understand what his needs are, uh, how they weren't met in childhood, how he seeks to meet them in maladaptive ways in his relationships with his girlfriends and perhaps his friends, but also perhaps the therapist. And over time, hopefully uh, begin to uh, uh, kind of uh, process that and uh, uh, help him to move away from this desperate seeking of care and uh, to, to a place where he's more uh, self-sufficient. Thanks, Jeff. 
Now, um, we will be we'll be continuing our panel discussion, and and I can see lots of things already. I'm really interested in this idea about we we need to have boundaries that are both flexible and clear at the same time. And I think this is a really complex work and. Hester's recommendation for having supervision, even if you're a GP, um, I think was really wise. What I'd like to do is invite the audience. So you have a, um, you're going to have a poll come up on your screen, and what I'd like you to do is pick the one that you would most like the panel to discuss. So there are uh, those themes up there. So things like about the prevalence and prognosis of personality disorder, the relationship between personality disorder and substance use how to engage people with personality disorder, um, things like choosing treatment and what order. So if you could just choose your favourite and uh, we'll, that will just help the uh, panellists to get a sense of what most interests you. So hopefully you're seeing that survey at the moment and uh, the results are coming in there. I think it's getting close to adding up to 100 so we might... Uh, We'll have 10 more seconds. How about that? Not that I'm exactly counting. 10 Queensland seconds. OK. I think we might close it there. So actually, the thing that um, people are most interested in is the treatment options and the sequencing issues. So what order do we do things and how do we choose what to do? Um, the next most um, requested topic is around engagement. So how do we actually engage people like this who probably by definition are quite uh, chaotic and, and sometimes a bit challenging in their behaviour. So treatment options and the sequencing issues, engagement and then a pretty much equal around um, the relationship between PD and substance use and trauma. So our panel, what I'd like to do is to come back and we'll, we'll look at this from the, the aspect of um, treatment options and sequencing issues. And read back if I can just get my norm, that's great. So now I can just slide back to our um, panel discussion there. So I think I might bring Trevor back in. So Trevor, with, we'll go back to the case and to David. So he's, he's mm -hmm. been to the GP and the GP's referred him to you. What would help you think about where to begin with David? Yep. I think the immediate response needs to be safety. Um, we're not going to get anywhere if he's unsafe, if he's still injuring himself, if he's drinking to the point where he's um, putting himself at risk. Then, then the um, issues, from my perspective at least, is to make sure we're establishing a safe place for for David. Um, and um, again, uh, the, the the key kind of interventions here, um, the, the the evidence is really clear that the integrated treatments are best. So you're not you're kind of looking at treating both both diagnoses, both disorders simultaneously rather than 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 one or the other. Historically, it has been a bit of a ping pong match between mental health services flicking patients who've got substance abuse over drug and alcohol, and vice versa, and people invariably falling through the gaps. And hopefully, we've learnt from that over the last you know forty odd years, um, where it's been talked about so that integrated treatments are are, um, are given prevalence. Having said that, it's actually not that easy to do because how, who is the person that's that's um, that's kind of negotiating um, different treatment aspects? Um, if somebody gets really unwell and if they need to be hospitalised to be safe, then that that you know that's a referral or that's a negotiation to try to get somebody in into a safer environment. But we're also you know conscious that. This population is already over overrepresented in those more contained environments, and therefore, um, step down options in terms of are there are there other things that people can do to manage those more more immediate crises to avoid going into hospital if they can. Um, so, so first of all, safety establishing safety that can be suicide or self harm contracts. Um, can be um, looking at do they have a plan for suicide and can we intervene with that, that with those things in, you know as a, as a priority um, and also looking at their substance use and, and if they're not prepared to kind of stop or, or, or at least um, engage in a conversation about it looking at can will they be more interested will, will they be open to reducing 
or at least you know cutting down so that so that that isn't um, which is one of their main re which is a person's main one of their main risk factors I guess in terms of any any self harm or uh, suicidality substance abuse is, is is often involved in that so if we can reduce the substance uh, um, abuse and and um, get them to a safe enough place that they're usually the first they're usually the first steps. Um, you know, b before we can engage in any of these r repetitive, problematic, um, in interpersonal themes that we've, we've been mentioning, um, it needs to, it needs, safety needs to be a priority. And um, Trevor, I'd just like to bring Hester back in there. So I think one of the things that GPs can do is also some advocacy around very practical things. So I, might, I often think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and I know da David's probably okay. I think he's got somewhere to live and. You know, he's going to uni. He's probably got some kind of income support. But Hester, do you find that safety actually might involve things as basic as food and shelter? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So homelessness is is a, is a real issue. Uh, and you know, the thing the thing for us in general practice is that this is really hard stuff to do as a as a single practitioner in your room where you've got fifteen or twenty minute appointments. You know, so actually having the capacity to build, bring in other services and being aware of what other services are out there so that the basic needs of having a safe roof over your head and food uh, are addressed because unless that's addressed you, you can't look at any of the other stuff. And you know it's not uncommon for me to see people that are homeless and they're using lots of drugs because life is just awful because they have nothing. And you, have you found, I mean I think we probably all agree that having an integrated approach is um, is best practice, but the realities of the system that's very fragmented. You know, what are any? Do you have some practical tips for how, how, for example, a GP can know about all of those things that are available in their community, and they're constantly yeah. changing. The NGO funding yeah. changes, the government yep. changes. Exactly, exactly. And and as a GP, you you, you know, we're hearing that long term treatment, that there needs to be long term engagement, and yet what funding do we have? The majority of people at ten sessions a year, which is a drop in the bucket. You're just trying. You're just starting at the end of those ten sessions to to get some kind of engagement and some trust there, and then it's it's the end of it. And I always jokingly say, don't get sick until October, because you'll get ten sessions in this year, and then you can get another ten sessions at the beginning of next year. Um, the other issue that we is that we have is that mental health and drug and alcohol services are fragmented, and mental health and drug and alcohol services are a very small organisation. And the ability for those services to work in with general practice and to work in with private psychology and, and, and counselling services it is, 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 is very difficult. Uh, you know, so, but in terms of what's out there, I mean, certainly our local um, primary health networks um, have been involved in some programs to actually access additional uh, funding for people, uh, you know, DBT programs, if you can get your patient onto them. In the public system there's a very long wait, but if you can get your patients onto them that's brilliant. Private hospitals quite often will have DBT programs. So one of the things that, that um, you know, is, a, is a real godsend is if any of your patients or their families actually have private health cover. Uh, so that that can support them as well. I, I, I just I don't have any great solutions. I think it's a really tricky area, and we're letting this group of people down through the funding and system uh, issues that we have. Yeah, and I, I mean I guess one of the things you have mentioned there is is actually becoming aware of what is available in your local area, and even if it's constantly mm -hmm. changing, being willing to be kind of flexible and innovative in cobbling together some kind of program. But um, yeah. But and that requires so much collaboration and communication, exactly. which is why we have these webinars. So exactly. I think, um, Jeff, you probably are perhaps in more of a position to provide that long-term therapy. And I, I wondered if you'd like to comment about that sort of domain. Yeah, it's important to remember that, that all of the evidence-based treatments for borderline personality are both intensive and long-term. Most of them involve attendance twice a week and uh, and often recommend uh, at least six months but usually a year or so of treatment. Those lengths are really established by um, research considerations about how long you can do a, a research project for. Most people know that people with uh, significant borderline issues will be in treatment if they stay in treatment for more than a year, sometimes for several years. And that that doesn't 
uh, that's not determined by the type of treatment. Um, now, I'm sure a lot of people out there when they hear this, where for psychologists, when you've got uh, people have 10 sessions a year, it's going to make their hair stand on end. So how can we make this work? Um, as Hester said, there, well, there is some support for some people from private health insurance. But in my experience, uh, people who do engage in treatment and feel that there is some hope in it will often work to pay for treatment. And I've seen people uh, uh, who've had um, success in therapy over the longer term who who I, who will work really hard to, to make sure they have the money to pay for treatment. Um, but for those people who uh, are so dysfunctional that they can't work even part time or they don't have the resources to do that, then yeah, unfortunately the public system is is what's available and uh, and as Hester said, there's long waiting lists for that. But the, we need to kind of think about, you know, what what is it that is shown to work, and then deal with the realities of that, and uh, and often patching together sessions with the GP and the um, uh, uh, the psychologist can uh, help to to provide more extended support. But um, uh, but long term treatment is possible if if the person engages and they do have the capacity to work and pay for their own treatment. And thanks, Jeff. And I think one of the things that came out in both yours and Trevor's presentations at the beginning was the um, importance of the therapeutic relationship. And even if someone is very chaotic and just popping into the GP three or four times a year, if that relationship and those consultations are helpful and therapeutic, I've, I've noticed that sometimes people can kind of calm down and become to a, come to a more functional place where they can then engage in the longer term therapy. So I'd, I think I'd like to bring um, Trevor back in now and remembering that the audience is really interested in um, treatment choices and, and sequencing. And the, in the registration questions, there was a lot of questions about is there a different, some, some, one way of viewing it is that the substance use is another unhealthy coping strategy for mm. emotional difficulties. So someone who can't regulate their emotions in healthy ways is doing whatever they can to make themselves feel better and the substance use is just part of that. So the primary mm. problem is the personality disorder. Other people view them as two separate problems. So I wonder mm. if, if there's a, how do we um, think usefully about that and how do we make mm. a decision about which way to go? Yeah, I think you're right and I think, um yeah, people who have substance abuse problems, when they're in active addiction, will, will, will often demonstrate a whole bunch of the characteristics of um, that would, would meet the criteria for personality disorder. So it's kind of a chicken or the egg argument, and I think I think the um, the um, key point is where does the person where, where's the person engaging? So if they're if they're um, they're contacting a substance abuse facility, for example, then and and it looks pretty clear that um, there's also personality disorders. There is the is that facility um, open or, or skilled enough, or or at least able to to bring additional kind of um, services in to address address say the emotion regulation stuff and the stress tolerance and and start to kind of unpack some of those relational dynamics that are um, problematic for them. So it's kind of not many doors. You can pick, it doesn't matter which door somebody comes through. If, if we if we really are working towards um, trying to provide as an integrated approach as possible, and you know, notwithstanding all the all the challenges that, that people have mentioned, that this is hard to do because people um, people and services services in particular are not necessarily that that well integrated. And, and, and you know, in the first instance, we need to be working very hard to kind of do more of that. Um, but regardless of which door somebody walks through, they all should they all should be able to go and to get the, the range of of, um, of, of treatments um, necessary. I mean, my my rule of thumb is if the drinking in this case, in David's case, if the drinking is causing problems, the drinking is a problem, and and it's not wise to just see it as a um, a coping mechanism because of an underlying personality disorder. I think I think they both need to be treated equally in in that regard. 
Okay, thank you. And I think Hester, you, you, I'll just ask you the same question. So is, is the, uh, the, I mean, I think you're, there's a distinction between um, dependency or just problematic use. But um, yeah, so could you just answer that same question about is this just a way of coping with difficult emotions? Just unmute your microphone. Sorry, I'm talking away and nobody can hear me. Um, look, yeah, I think this, this can be uh, a, a number of different things, but the really important thing from my point of view is that we're talking about substance abuse. I have a great deal of difficulty with the idea of this. I know it's in the DSM, but abuse, I think it's quite problematic in itself. It's, it's quite judgmental. Uh, but also we've got the issue of physiological dependency and you have to treat that. You can't just think, absolutely, it might have started out as a coping me mechanism, but they have actually developed a chronic relapsing medical condition. And you do need to diagnose, you know, where, where are they on that dependency spectrum? And when they try and stop, what are their physical withdrawals like? And you can't just allow people to think that they're just going to have to manage that. That needs to be medically managed and it can be dangerous as well. You know, a complicated uh, withdrawal from alcohol, which may not be the case for this young man, but he's, he's you know, he's drinking daily um, and he's very likely to have really quite uncomfortable symptoms when he tries to stop drinking. So supporting him, understanding that he will need that support for his, his physical dependency that he's developed at the same time as helping them to understand how it, it originated as perhaps as a coping mechanism that he is now using that is causing him harm. And understanding that it is a chronic condition that doesn't just, you don't just detox and it goes away. And so that's, that's again where that collaboration between the different kinds of services might be really helpful if you don't have yeah. a one-stop shop. I mean, it's, Absolutely. I, I it's very difficult to, to find medical detox where yep. I am. I'm not sure yep. if that's yep. the case in yep. Sydney or Hobart or Canberra. but Many of these patients can be managed in the outpatient setting. For us as GPs, a lot of us are not confident around that, but it is possible. Uh, and what I would be saying to GPs is have a talk to your local drug and alcohol services, get advice, get support. There's DASIS, which is a 24-7 um, number in New South Wales, which has drug and alcohol experts. And there are other numbers in other states as well, DACUS and DASIS in other states. So get some advice around does this person actually need to be admitted or can I actually manage them in the outpatient setting with picking up the medication to help the withdrawal? Um, and a detox, can they do that from a pharmacy? The other thing I just wanted to quickly say is that if, you know, to all the, the counsellors and psychologists, I love that when you, when you call me, I love it when you speak to me, I love it when we can work collaboratively. I am fortunate as a GP that I can charge under Medicare for case conferencing, so you know, I really do value those conversations and it's really important that we do make time to actually try and work um, to, to have a common kind of goal uh, with, the, with the patients involved and of course working together. So call me. <laughs> Thanks Hester. And I know like, the time's going really quickly as it always does and we can see so many different directions we could go. So I have to apologise to the audience that we cannot possibly answer all of your questions tonight. But um, so Jess, uh, I might just come bring you back in. Have you got any tips for us around things that have worked for you with regard to collaboration. So when you have had someone where you've perhaps been providing the therapy and they've had a co-occurring substance use disorder or problem, you know, what, what's worked? How, how can, have you got any tips for how we can do this in a practical way to work together? Yeah, I, I, I would, um pick up on what Hester said and uh, I think it's important to keep in contact with other people involved in uh, the person's care and if someone has a, a, a serious alcohol problem for example and they need detox then yeah you have to coordinate with the, the, the local services and ensure that that, that happens. Uh, that's not something that uh, that should be supervised by a medical person. And yeah, I think it, it, it's just important. The most important thing is that we talk to each other. And as Hester was saying, and make sure, you know, we're on the same page. And if, 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 if there is some misunderstanding, to make sure that's clarified. Uh, often the, the, what I find is that the, 
the treatment of people with personality disorder is long term and this needs to be explained because uh, other people involved in the care can begin to question why is the treatment taking so long. Uh, but if you knew the person's life story, their, their, their trauma background, then uh, it would be obvious that you're not going to solve this in 10 sessions. So I think you know, I, I would just uh, reiterate, I think the key is communication. Great, thank you. And I think one group that we haven't really mentioned tonight that's really important is that and the families and carers of the patients that we mm -hmm. see as well. And I know, Trevor, that's been an area of your interest. And I just wondered if you wanted to comment around how you might collaborate with, I mean, I don't know about David's particular situation, but how do you begin? Uh, yeah, look, I, I absolutely agree. In, so, in some respects, you can kind of look at the family and, and carers and loved ones as, as, um, as, as being diagnostically and kind of in terms of case formulation, you want to include that to kind of see it because often they're like a trigger. They're, they're often um, involved in, in, um, in relapses. Um, so, but they can be a great, a great relapse prevention and in fact a recovery support. Um, in themselves. So even though pr primarily we've been talking about collaborating between services, um, fair, uh, carers, families, uh, loved ones are, are often, um, even friends and, and even employers are often people that aren't accessed enough of in order to support that person. Of course, with the client's permission, um, that they become part of the actual treatment itself and some tremendous work can be done with, with couples and with, with family interventions and, and empowering families to, to be able to be recovery supports. And notwithstanding that, that, that we know that, that carers and families have their own challenges. They're often one of the most distressed um, populations in our, in our population. Um, and, and often go unrecognised, and their levels of distress, unless they're, they've got some skills to manage those, will, will often um, will often contribute to distress within the relationships that the that, that the clients like Jeff are faced with. So, if we can intervene at that level, then we have an opportunity to 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 kind of redress the whole system around the person, and not just that, that as an yeah, an isolated individual, because it never is. So, um, yeah. Ways to do that again would be starting with an invitation by by a permission with the client, getting consent to, to do so, um, but also you know looking at what what do they see that the issues to be. That can be really useful information in and of itself, but also what part they may be playing in it, and getting to that that recognition, and then looking at some skills to kind of manage that, and then and overcome some of the dynamics that are being perpetuated by these relationships. Mm. Thank you. So we're just very near the end of our webinar and I'm going to invite each of you to, um, to just give us a couple of a final point that you'd like to make. And I just want to acknowledge that we still have 1,520 people wow. online uh, and more than that because there's groups of people as well. So it's just fantastic to um, see people's interest and, and obviously their commitment to helping people with these really complex problems in a system that isn't always set up to do it in an ideal way. So, um, Hester, I'd like you to just comment if there's any final take-home message that you want to leave the audience with tonight. Yeah, thanks, Mary. Look, I, I think that apart from all the other stuff that we've said, the other thing is really taking a good drug and alcohol history so that you understand where they're sitting on that spectrum of dependency, but also that stuff around helping to enhance their sense of self-efficacy. Because, you know, we want to jump in and help and I get it, but it's actually learning to walk that line between giving them the support they need but also helping them to take control of their lives. And hearing their stories, being witness to their stories, I think is the most important thing I'd finish with. Thank you. And I would like to invite Jeff now if you had something final that you'd like to say. Well, that was a good segue from Hester because I'll start with uh, empathy. <laughs> I think. Well, most people when confronted with uh, 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 these kind of serious problems with people with personality disorders, their empathy goes out the window because uh, uh, often strong emotion is evoked just in, in the therapeutic relationship. So uh, I, I want to say a couple of things. One is uh, these are people, if you knew their story, uh, 
if you were in their life, you would be like that too. So uh, strive to understand uh, uh, what the person is struggling with and where they've come from. The other thing I would stress to psychologists is use what you know. If you've got training in, in um, psychodynamic therapy like I have or schema therapy or something like that, that's fine. But many people in country situations may not have that training. However, use what you know. Um, if you have training in other interventions, then you can integrate treatment by uh, uh, looking at what problem markers are coming up in the session and use effective interventions to address that in a modular fashion. Uh, most of us do this anyway. We, we've, we've all trained in all sorts of different therapies and we tend to find what works for us with our clients. And um, yeah, so my other message would be use what you know. Thanks. I think that's really practical, useful advice. And, and I didn't acknowledge that we do have a lot of uh, rural and regional and even some remote uh, participants in the audience. It's mm -hmm. fantastic to remember that what you've got is often good enough, or at least it can make a big difference. And then finally, uh, Trevor, I just wondered if you wanted to offer anything in the wrapping up. Yep, I'll just extend on some of that too in as much as um, when, when we're faced with, with multiple comorbid conditions that, um, that we're not necessarily starting with the worst case scenario. I mean, the people will have strengths. People will have things they can tap into to assist their recovery. They're, nobody's kind of, you know, there's no, no one actually lives in a vacuum, even though some people's lives are very, you know, reflect that often. There's, there are still strengths there. Recovery is built on strength. It's not, it's not built on, on problems. We can skill people up to manage the problems, but really recovery moves forward with people finding what's actually not broken, what is working, what they can rely on. And we can add to that in terms of our, our um, reliability as therapists to be able to be there for them consistently. Thanks, Trevor. And thank you to all three of you, first of all, for your um, really fantastically useful slides and resources, and then for um, the conversations that, you've, that we've had. Um, it's, it's been really helpful to know that even someone with the kind of complex presentation that David brought to us, um, that there are ways in which people can be helped and indeed can recover. Uh, and particularly that when we're able to work together with, with each other, with the patient and with their families and carers. And even as Trevor pointed out, all kinds of people may be useful. And I guess that the key thing I got, a, got out of it all was that you know, we, we need to know our stuff well, know our theory well, be thorough in our assessment, but actually the relationship is really important with each other and with the person and their family. So thank you all so much for um, participating. And I would just like to, before we finish, just to remind the audience to please complete the feedback survey before you log out so it'll come up on your screen. If it doesn't, there's a feedback survey tab at the top of the screen. You will receive an attendance certificate in two weeks if you registered for the webinar. And you'll also receive an email with a link to the resources associated with the webinar, including a recording of the webinar in the next few weeks. Uh, and the other thing is that um, Project AIR runs other activities you may be interested in, and MHPN also runs their webinars. So please keep an eye on both those websites for professional development. And once again, thank you all very much for your participation this evening. And hopefully everybody stays warm and enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night.